All righty. So welcome to Business and Racial Awareness, Moving from Conversations to Action. Quick background on how this came about. Uh, Glenn and I had planned a four-part session that uh, didn't take off the way we thought it would, but we decided, hey, you know what? There's some people who were really interested in this, so we're going to kind of condense and do as much as we can in a one one-hour session. At the end, if you are interested in more, of course, Glenn is available. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But um, So thank you for joining us today. Your interest is uh, inspirational to us to see more and more people are interested in this topic. I'm Ben Lichtenwalner. I'm the founder of Radiant Forest, which is a niche leadership development form, firm. We basically focus on helping you fix and prevent bad boss behaviors in your organization. We do that mostly through servant leadership, ed education, and awareness, and principles applications. So. Uh, Glenn, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, and my name is Glenn Guyton, and uh, I'm the owner of Guystar Enterprises. And I work with organizations that want to improve productivity and profitability through creative leadership and strong cultural competency practices. And so uh, I'm a practitioner uh, in the diversity, equity, and inclusion field. I've been doing this for a couple of decades now. And so uh, I, I think the the uh, society is actually catching up on some of the work that we've been doing for a long time. So it's great to be here. Thanks, Glenn. Glenn. Thanks for coming. I was really glad that Glenn was able to do this. So before we get in too far into the presentation, I want to just cover a couple of quick topics. You know, um, you'll, we'll be chatting. Everybody can see the chat. So we just want to remind everybody, make sure you know your biases. You know, we may not know about them today, but understand that we all have our own biases. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. Part of it is understanding that there is this implication for each of us. Feedback is positive. Remember that if you hear something on here that is uh, that you may take as critical to you, don't be defensive. It's it, any the only way we grow is through feedback. And then engage the resistance. This is a concept that came out of the White Fragility book, which I really like the way she framed it. You know, it's there's that resistance that we have to learning something new or taking a new approach or new understanding to something that we've held for a long time engage that resistance. It's about what we do with that resistance that helps us to either grow or shrink and, and not be any better than we are today. So keep those three key points in mind. Anything you would add to that, Glenn? No, I think, you, I think we're on a good start. Yeah, knowing your biases, that's important. We all have it. Uh, you, you'll hear a lot about implicit bias and unconscious bias, but we all have biases and we have to own that as we do this work. Great. Great. And like Glenn said, it's going to be a quick 60 minutes, so we're going to jump right into racism. Ooh, it's like a cold splash in your face, racism. Well, there was an excellent quote from the book White Fragility uh, that says, the key to moving forward is what we do with our discomfort. We can use it as a door out, blame the messenger and disregard the message, or we can use it as a door in by asking, why does this unsettle me? What would it mean for me if this were true? So earlier, I asked, uh, you know, where you're from. No one like got defensive about, oh, where where you're from. No one was probably, hopefully, you weren't embarrassed about where you're from. But when we get into these discussions on on race, we start to get uncomfortable. There's discomfort in talking about our race, particularly probably if you are a, a, a white person. It's probably a little bit more challenging uh, for you. But I always tell white people, I say, hey. You can be proud to be white. Now, you may not want to scream that running down the street saying, hey, you know, I'm <laughs> white pride. You may not want to do that. But <laughs> we have to be able to talk about race in order to move forward. You know, we're all different. We have a number of different identity factors. Race is just one of those. So I'm going to ask a question, and, and you all can get into the, uh, the, the chat uh, but my question is, when did you first become aware of your race? That's, that's, type that in. I want to spend some time. When did you first become aware of your race? And I'm interested to see what uh, people are saying. Great. Just give y'all a couple of minutes to type that in. And when you're typing, just give a thought as to how old you were, maybe, and uh, a little bit about uh, the, you know, how, how it came about for you. And as we're waiting for some comments to come in, Glenn, you know, for me, um, I, as a as a white guy, it's interesting. I had a hard time thinking about an answer to this, and I, I think it had something to do with the fact that because it's white, it didn't really, it never really was an issue for me, at any point in my life, um, until, frankly, I, I met my wonderful wife, who happens to be African American, and 
And it became an issue for me in that I was wondering, well, maybe she's not interested in white guys. I don't know. But that was the first time that my race really became an issue or a concern for me, I'd say. And uh, we've got a couple of comments coming in here, Glenn. Yeah. Lots of great comments. We've got, um, let's see here. Someone said, as a teenager listening to adult conversations, yep. uh, elementary school, college, someone said college, because they grew up in a 99% white community. That's, that's a very yeah. interesting co comment, yeah. And that was very similar for me, too, I got to say. It was largely yeah. white for me, yeah. And, and so as, as we, we look at the comments and see how people have navigated this, you know, we, we, we come to this understanding of race at different times, even my kids, you know, it took them a while to understand about race. I think I was pretty much aware, as long as I can remember, uh, we talked about race. I had parents that grew up in, in Mississippi and in, in the, uh, my parents are actually quite old. My, my dad was born in 1907, my mother born in 1928. So talking about their experience. So race was something I was, I think was always aware of it. Uh, it was, but it wasn't a negative thing. Uh, and some people, if we come from these more monolithic type of cultures, we aren't always aware of, of, of race. Uh, if we are in the majority, you know, if everyone looks like us, talks like, talk, talks like us, sounds like us, you know, it, it's, uh, it's easier for us to overlook race when we are in what, some people would call the dominant culture. Yeah. But as we think about all those things, we think about our uh, struggles and our and our identity. I want to talk a, a little bit about two different uh, definitions here. Um, as we think about race, racism, uh, those words are, are used quite often now. But I want to break those things down a little bit as we uh, do this work. And just before we jump into that, Glenn, I did want to highlight there's somebody I'm going to assume and respect that they want to be anonymous. I don't know their full name, but they uh, they shared very powerful comments. Said when I was four or five, my mom would take the long way oh, to wow. avoid the weekly Klan rally when we lived in Virginia. Oh wow! That's... I lived in Virginia for a while. I wonder what part of Virginia. I can think of a number of parts of Virginia where that might have been yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's an interesting point because there's so many times that um, you know, in business and and wherever we are in our working life, we tend to think of, you know racism and or you know especially clan rallies we tend to think of that as some ancient past and, it, and yeah. it's not i mean we have a yeah. member here on this discussion right now who as he was growing up had to avoid the clan rally when they were traveling that's that's pretty powerful thank you for sharing that all right but onto the uh, the definitions you kind of wanted to walk into yeah and and so there are just a number of different things that are going on uh as, as we think about oppression as we think about discrimination but you know first of all is prejudice we all have prejudice we prejudge people we often have these uh, irrational fears uh, of people or things that are different from us um, you know oftentimes this prejudice is is negative uh, it's highly emotional and we we can direct it towards different groups that we have limited information about uh, based on things we've seen on on TV or stories that we've heard when we were younger or the fear uh, like the example of of a uh, driving uh, in, in Virginia uh, so those things can all create prejudice uh, and, and create this negative uh, sense we have of other people uh, or our interactions with other people and so that's that's it's normal right it's normal to have prejudice or to prejudge. Then we move to discrimination where we begin to treat people differently because of our prejudice. Um, we uh, focus on different uh, individuals that we want to exclude or different groups that we want to exclude. And sometimes this discrimination uh, is overt, sometimes it's covert, sometimes it's a little bit more hidden. We don't always know what's going on. And so any of these types of uh, prejudice that leads to discrimination, they can be based in many different forms of identity. Uh, for example, I can, I can really be prejudiced against people that like the Washington football team. That's their new name, right? I'm, <laughs> I'm a Cowboys fan. And so I could really be prejudiced against uh, the Washington football team for a number, number of reasons, other than they're just bad uh, football <laughs> team. Um, but do I act on it? Uh, once I start making decisions and ex uh, ex uh, excluding people saying, hey, if you are a Washington football team fan, I don't want to talk to you. You can't get a job here. But is that racial? No, it's based on my dislike or prejudice against the football team. 
as we start bringing in racial identity, then it becomes either race-based prejudice or race-based discrimination. But it's not necessarily racism. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Ben. Yeah, just that I'm an Eagles fan, so I can definitely relate to the Washington district. Okay, all right, all right. Uh, <laughs> so let's, let's go to racism, and, and let's talk about that, since that word is thrown out uh, quite often. And so racism is when we take our prejudice, and that dis dis discrimin discriminatory power, and, and they, we combine the two. So it's race-based prejudice plus the systemic abuse of power. That's how I want you to think about uh, racism as you talk about it in your circles. It's not just simple prejudice or you not liking anyone, but it's that prejudice combined with some type of systemic power that uh, legitimizes basically, basically your bias or your hate. Uh, so it's through laws, legislations, uh, access to finances, education, uh, it's a tool that powerful people use to exclude another group. And it's part of a system of a framework. So it could be the rules of your organization, the culture that you operate in. What racism is not, is not your personal feelings. You know, your personal feelings would be more of that prejudice. Uh, you can discriminate based on your personal feelings. It's, uh, you know, Sometimes we think our individual actions, if someone says something hateful to us, that's racism. Maybe that's race-based prejudice, but racism is this collective structure that seeks to disenfranchise an entire, an entire group. And so if you think about this definition, uh, sometimes um, people of color are accused of being racist. Well, they can have race-based prejudice, uh, they can have some form of race-based discrimination, but racism is a tool of the powerful, so a tool of those in the dominant culture. So technically, as you're thinking about this, uh, racism is not a tool of people of color. It's a tool of white people in the, do the dominant culture. And it's not like a one-time thing. Someone says something hateful to you. No, uh, racism is an ongoing system of oppression that disenfranchises a targeted group. It's wow. really baked into our American culture. That's why that you have, you see that dough, it's baked into this culture. It's something that's inherent in the foundations of what, what we've done in this country. So Glenn, is it safe to say racists are often big, some of the largest contributors to racism, but right. racism is the bigger picture. It's the... It's the bigger picture because as we, uh, think about some of these things. I don't want to get a, get ahead of myself, but as we think sure. about some some of these things, and we think about uh, you know folks saying hateful things, or we think about the overt white supremacists. Those those really aren't the the dangerous uh, mm -hmm. aspects of racism. It's really more of controlling like who can vote, uh, mm -hmm. how do how do we draw our political districts. Uh, who has access to loans, to, to housing, those systemic things that take away our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, those American dreams right. that we all have. Uh, and so actually racism, as you think about the history, we, don't, we won't go a lot, uh, too much into that because we don't have much time. But as you, as you think about slavery here in, in the United States, it was very unique. It was chattel slavery. So it was a generational uh, type of slavery. It wasn't like, hey, I'm, I'm going to make you a slave until you pay off debts, which was common in other countries. But no, it, you're born into slavery. You're, you're sold as property. There is no way for you to escape the system that we've established. And that continues to create uh, issues as we move forward. Great. And we're getting some great feedback on the chat here, Glenn. Derek said, this is really explains the idea of there is no reverse racism. Thank you. So are no. racists willful practitioners and propagators of racism? Yes. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's a good one. We're, we're, can can uh, can people of color be evil? Yes. Can people of color uh, discriminate? Yes. Can people of color have prejudice against uh, white people uh, or even other people of color? Yes. But that's not what we're talking about when we talk about racism. You can overcome individual hatred. It's harder to overcome. Uh, institutionalized oppression. Got it. Got it. And so here, just yeah, the big three: racism, power over people of color, racism, racism's power to preserve and maintain 
power and privilege. So that's the thing to maintain the power and privilege of white society. It's an ongoing thing. I talked again a little bit about chattel slavery and then racism's ultimate power to control and disrupt everyone's lives. I like to say we're all victims of racism, even white people, uh, as, as you think about it. Uh, we're forced into these uh, ideological and identity boxes that, you know, we, we really don't have a choice to choose. You know, Ben has uh, kids who are biracial, uh, but, you know, do they get to make the choice of, of, of who they have more of affinity with or, it, or will society dictate that for them? Mm. Yeah, good point. Really good point. And I liked um, in the book, White Fragility, I really loved the example that the author gave of the bird in the cage when we talk about systemic and being such a critical component of racism. Um, she mentions that, you know, you can look at a bird in a cage and if you get up close enough to the cage, you can't see the wires or maybe you only see one or two of the bars mm -hmm. and you think, well, why can't the bird just get around those bars? But then when you take a step back and you look at all of the bars and you see them all, you start to see the issue where there's so many pieces to the systemic racism that suddenly you understand that structure, this broader structure that is having such a negative impact on people's lives. And, and like you said, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. There's just so many aspects to it that it's not just one or two things. Sure, everybody has one or two things that are tough in their life. But when you're addressing racism, there's a massive system out there that causes the challenge. Yep. It's true. Good examples there. Yeah. And I also liked in the book, um, they talked a lot about uh, why white people are so resistant. Why do we get so defensive when somebody talks about racism? And she brings up two key concepts that helped me better understand why that happens. Because you know, I, I see it all the time with my colleagues and peers. Sometimes it happens even in myself. I'll get some sort of a little bit of defensiveness when somebody suggests that maybe something I'm a part of or associated with has some aspect of racism. So why is it that we get defensive about it? And she highlights two key components. It's in society, mm -hmm. we are brought up, especially in the U.S. To in the U.S., yes. Sort of celebrate individualism and objectivity. Individualism being, you know, no matter what happens in the world, I can overcome it. I am an independent individual. I can... You know, we hear all the time, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? Yes. We have this belief that no matter what's going on around us, we don't have to be impacted by it, right. which is frankly asinine. We are impacted by it. You know, we have to understand that there's all these influences out there. Is there some aspect of individualism in our lives? Of course. But we cannot pretend or we should not pretend to be completely indifferent to what's happening around us. And yeah. then, yeah. Yeah, and I, and I was going to say, yeah, and, that, and that's, that's true. I think we, uh, you know, especially I think if we're from white culture, we don't appreciate that, that, that legacy that we can build upon that has actually helped us a lot. Right, right. And then the other side of that is the objectivity that, that we are completely free of any kind of bias, that as we are influenced by what's happening around us, we are independent thinkers and we are not influenced by what we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody here can associate to nowadays, depending on what your primary news source is, you are yes. largely influenced. Your biases are largely influenced by where you get your news nowadays. But we still have this thought, this uh, sort of cultural expectation that we are individuals and we will think objectively and not be influenced by what's happening around us or the biases that we consume. So I thought that was a, just a very crucial point for me in the book to understand why is it that particularly white people get so defensive about racism mm -hmm. and white privilege, the concept of white privilege. So, right. and we see uh, Scott had a question. So if I specifically look to hire someone of color to increase diversity in my company, it can't be racism to not look at Caucasian candidates or yeah, it can't be. How can we do this without violating fair labor laws? Yeah, well, I'm not, I'm not a, an a attorney, but I will give you some, uh, some guidance from uh, about this um you you, know, you you can't necessarily set your know, quotas you know quotas are illegal these hard quotas uh but you can take steps to increase your pool uh and it's found out that when you have an increased pool of qualified candidates then the likelihood that you will choose someone other than you know maybe the one narrow demographic uh 
has a better chance of success. And so, so you can look to increase uh, the diversity in your organization. That's, that's, that's quite legal, but you can't go in, into it saying, hey, I'm just I'm gonna exclude white, white people. You can't do right. that. But you can say, I, I want to increase uh, our, our diversity. Uh, we're gonna target certain groups. You know, uh, we're gonna campaign. We're gonna look in uh, some places that where we, we would normally look which will increase our qualified candidate pool. That's really how you should go, go at it. So you shouldn't go in and say, hey, we're just gonna eliminate uh, you know, white people. I think you need to go in and say, hey, we wanna increase the, uh, the candidate pool of qualified uh, candidates from a different demographic and, and use those tools to, to do that. Yeah, and I love, that's a great question, Scott. Thank you. And, um, and I love the sort of statement that I hear a lot right now, especially around the Black Lives Matter movement. It's not that, um, you know, that, that African Americans or people of color are looking for uh, L, uh, extra help up, they're just looking for fair treatment. And that means making sure that you've got a fair representation in your pool. One, actually more than one employer that I've worked for here in West Michigan, I must say, um, have often made sort of an excuse about the extremely white nature of their, of their employee base as saying, well, it's just the nature of our community that we live in. And I think, frankly, that's a BS answer because you know what? There's plenty of people who are willing to commute from Grand Rapids or, mm -hmm. and even Benton Harbor. You know, there's there's definitely regions where there are more people of color. And so, if you go five minutes down the road, you're going to find a more diverse pool of applicants. So I think that's the key: is kind of yep. boosting the candidacy pool. Yep, yep. It's very, very important. Very important. It, it is some statistics I won't throw out to you on that, but yeah, uh, look in some, look in different places. Don't don't. Uh, frequent the, the same, the common places that you would frequent to find your employees look, you know, turn over some new rocks. Yeah, and Scott just basically said makes sense and he gave some examples there of how he's used to it and in our area. Scott lives near me too and okay. um, definitely, definitely a predominance in this area, but we got to work to get out of that region. And so, yeah, thanks for sharing. All right. Back to you, Glenn. All right. So I have a, a quote here from uh, General Robert E. Lee, he, he's been in the news uh, quite a bit lately, so I thought a quote from him would be, be good. But he says, I believe and will acknowledge that slavery an institution, as an institution is a moral and political evil uh, in any country. It is useless to expiate on its disadvantages. I think it, however, a greater evil to the white than the black race. Then he goes on to say some things that are probably racist, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but, even Robert E. Lee, this Confederate general, realized the, the burden uh, of, uh, you know, of, of slavery on all of us. You know, it's, it's a, it was a political tool, how we've classified and thought, of, uh, thought about race. You know, race is really a social construct. It's, it's, there's no clear, uh, you know, definition or scientific uh, categoriz categorization of, of, of race. You know, we've we've created race to create these uh, disparities in our society. Again, you think of people that are multiracial, biracial, you know, who decides what race they get to be? Uh, and so as you so if you if you're white, I don't I can't tell what people are looking at this. But if you're if you're white, you have to understand that we are all kind of victims of this, this, this system. And so let's not hold on to something or these disparities, uh, the things that create bias or the fear that we're going to lose something based on race when we when we have to look beyond what it really is it's it's, it's a social construct used to perpetuate you know white supremacy uh perpetuate a uh, white power in our society so let's so let's 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 go to a question um if you can put in the chat when is when is there have been a time when you felt unsafe uh, because of your race. I think we maybe had one of one uh, comment about that earlier. Yeah, um, yeah. But yeah, but just look at this question. Has there been a time when you felt unsafe because of your race? You know, how often have you felt this way and why? Um, yeah, I don't know. So maybe I'll start this one. Sure. Ben. Uh, yeah, yeah and, I, and I live in Texas. Um, and often I... Uh, uh, drive to uh, you know different places here in Texas and sometimes we take the back roads not often but sometimes we take the back roads with my family and you know I, I always kind of look before I get out of the car when I stop at gas stations 
in these little rural towns to see, okay, is it going to be okay if I get out of the car with my family and stop here? You know, are there any other people of color? My wife has asked me before, is it okay if we stop here? Can we get out? I said, oh, there's some Hispanic people over there. I think we'll be fine. You know, but those are conscious decisions that I have to make. And uh, I remember uh, it's a place in Texas called Bider, Texas. Uh, my dad would never let us stop there when we would be driving on road trips. He'd say, no, this is the Klan capital. You can't stay. You can't go to McDonald's here. We will not stop here. You have to wait. Uh, so those are some things I remember growing up. Yeah. I can share too that, you know, with my interracial family, there are many times when we'll be traveling, I'll hit a gas station. And if I see a Confederate flag on a plate or something, I'll make sure the kids stay in the car while I go get whatever is needed. So I, you know, I know there's sensitivity to that for some people right now, but for our family, if we see a Confederate flag, I keep them away from mm -hmm. it right now yeah. as an example. Um, and that again, counter to my own personal self, there haven't been many times that I have had to feel that way, thankfully, but it's, you know, a nature of my race, I think. So, and I do see a comment here from Derek, one of the Derek's, thank you guys, entered a gas station in a predominantly black neighborhood, was told, we don't serve your kind and told wow. to leave. He said, wow. So wow. I'm, I'm assuming Derek is white? Yep. yep. Okay. All right. And Scott says, one of the Scots, <laughs> I've had a few issues where I was in danger, but couldn't imagine experiencing that on a consistent basis. Oh, good. Yeah. True. Yeah, I and, and just to Scott, I tell people sometimes if you imagine uh, a fish in a fish bowl, a goldfish, uh, if you are white, imagine yourself, you're that goldfish and you're swimming in water and, you know, fish don't know they're swimming in water, right? It just is, right? You, you're just wet. You're like, I'm just, this is just what I do. You're swimming in every day, you know, doing your goldfish thing. But then imagine if you are a person of color, you know, think about a whale, a whale and fish. I know not not goldfish, but whale and fish, they swim in the same water, right? They swim in the same ocean. But every now and then, that whale has to come up and breathe. And to me, that's the best analogy to think of, of what it, it is like to be a person of color wow. in the society. We're all swimming along, you know, oh, yeah, hey, hey you, you, you're you doing just like I am. We're in the same environment. You can get ahead just like I am. And, I, and I'll say, hey, but I got to come up and breathe every yeah. now and then. I can't, I can't just stay in this all the time. Every now and then I need to get to the surface because this is how this environment impacts me differently. Yeah, and that, that, was, that reminded me of a story again from White Fragility. The author talks about how one of her colleagues that she was doing a lot of diversity training with is, uh, was uh, African-American and the author is white. And um, she said, you know, I invited her to go on a vacation with me and get some, we've been working really hard. So I invited her to join me on this trip. And I forget where it was, but it was to some, very rural area where there was not likely to be any people of color and i guess i think it was actually close to some famous clan area too and and she said you know i didn't i didn't even think twice about it you know as the author the white person but you know the person of color who was working with her was like no thanks that's not what i would consider a vacation because <laughs> she's certainly not that whale coming up to breathe and you know and relaxing there she's going to be constantly under the pressure and stress of wondering is this person from the clan are they are they just backwards in their thinking you know um so that was, I thought that was a pretty good example too. Reading some of the comments. Yeah, some good chats here. Thanks guys for keeping those coming too. Lehigh um, Valley, Pennsylvania, okay. So the white here. person's where I'm in an area without other white people around you. It's the norm for a black person around here to be the, other, the only one, it's true. And, right. Um, examples of good. Again, Q, going to visit my wife's family in the Lehigh Valley. There are more than a few places where I get nervous seeing the Confederate flags. Yeah, that's sad, yeah. but true. I've been there. What do, what do we do now that they're getting ready to cut Confederate flag? I kind of, I have mixed feelings about that. I feel like that was my, kind of my canary in the coal mine. Mm -hmm. Now it's gone. Uh, it's probably, I, won't, I won't tell you the other flag you can watch for nowadays, because that might get okay. us But <laughs> All right. I think there's other indicators that are out there, too. All right. Well, let's go to the next <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Glenn says, keep moving, Ben. Keep moving. All right. Let's move on. All right. All right. And so uh, so white supremacy, that's another thing that we talk about. And we just kind of, good segue from the, uh, I guess, the Confederate flag or whatever. But uh, white supremacy is this overarching political, economic, and social dom uh, system of domination. It basically says, white is right. It's a saying uh, in the black community. I don't know if 
I don't know, being do they say that in the white community, white is right. Yeah, I haven't heard it. You ever heard that? It was, <laughs> but that's probably because you know, I'm not hanging around. Thing in the black community just to say, well, they white, so is is right. You know, that's the that's the definition of of being correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, you think about these big three: power over people, preservation. That's what white supremacy is. It's not. This I, I, I uh, watched the show. They were talking about the Klan. You know, we worry about the Klan. We worry about the skinheads. But really, the impact of those radical white supremacists is is very little. I mean, yeah. you know, they they make a big show. They get on TV, uh, but they really don't impact people as much as this hidden system of white supremacy, which defines uh, whiteness as rightness. Um, yeah. I was I was in the military, so I think that's a, is that F twenty two. I'm not sure what planes I put up there. I think that's F twenty two. But I was in the military, and uh, one of the things in the Air Force they talked about was basically air supremacy. It was when uh, the U S. military took over a country, so that no other aircraft would even think about uh, you know taking off. There there was a term in the military called air superiority which would, would be like if other planes were flying, we would take them out, we would be better. But the Air Force then moved to air supremacy, which like you're not gonna even get off the ground. We're not gonna even let you think about coming into our environment. That's what mm -hmm. white supremacy is. It's saying that we control this, we run this, we set the rules, and we're gonna do everything in our power to make sure uh, people that are different from us, people that aren't white, don't get too far ahead. That's what white supremacy is, and it comes, uh, it comes in many dis different forms. Sometimes you see powerful people of color raise up, and then they get knocked down. There, there are always exceptions to this uh, 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 in, in society. There are people, you know, I'm an upper middle class, you know, African American person, but it, I'm not, I'm not like the, the the norm. I would be further ahead in wealth disparity uh, with black people than I would be with with white people. Mm. Mm. So let's go to the next slide. I like that analogy. That's good. So the idea of racial in inferiority was created to justify unequal treatment. Belief in racial inferiority is not what triggered unequal treatment, nor was it fear of difference. Uh, but race is the child of racism, not the father. See, that's, that's, that's powerful right there. Uh, in order to, you have to have, uh, create these, you have to create these barriers, uh, these definitions in order in order to justify racism. Yeah. And while while we're here, I want to take a quick pause because there's some more great comments coming in. Tim made a good example of, uh, you know, after he moved to a more diverse area, he he started to uncover some of the things he didn't see when he was growing up. And uh, Q mentioned it's the white supremacy that supremacist, I think he means that wears a suit and tie sitting in an office yeah. who has the power to make decisions that affect my life scare me more than the white hoods. And I, I yeah. that's, thank you for sharing that. That's, that's what this is about, right? It's under, that's the point is many of you here on this session are in those business environments and have the opportunities to present or responsibilities to own. And that's what we're talking about today. So yes, so thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and so as we think about uh, whiteness, the definition of whiteness has actually changed over time. It's not set in stone uh, as I guess the white culture or white supremacists have needed to add to that. You know, we've changed the definition. And so we've mm -hmm. added, you know, white Hispanics now. We've added uh, Italian, Italians and Jews, people that weren't white at various points in our history. Right. Ready for a question? Yes. All right. How have you benefited from being white or have you, or if you're not white, uh, what have you had to do differently? That's a good question. Yeah. I while guess it's a good question because I came up with it, but it's a good question. <laughs> of course. <laughs> while we're letting people give that some thought and type it in, I want to share a little story from my own example. And that was um, back uh, early in my career, there was, uh, I was at a wedding and on the way back from that wedding, I saw an elderly gentleman on a fairly rural road struggling to uh, put on a spare tire on his vehicle. And I, so I just got over and pulled over and helped him and put it on. And as we're chatting throughout the period of the conversation, 
it became clear that he was my boss's 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 father I think, mm. at the time. And uh, that evolved into, you know, he was the, basically the gentleman was the CIO of a Fortune 500 company that I was working for. It was his father. And uh, so the CIO reached out to thank me the next day. And it led to a relationship in which he became a, a strong mentor for me and really helped me advance pretty quickly in my career at that company. Um, now, I think back to that moment, and I think if I were a black man on a rural road in Michigan, in a rural area of Michigan, would I have felt comfortable stopping to pull over and offer assistance? Um, or would I have been, you know, better safe than sorry and just kind of keep going? And how did that impact my career? So I certainly wouldn't have had that opportunity to have a great mentor and leader as quickly and easily as I did. So, yeah, um, yeah I think that was one way that definitely helped my career. And because I was white, it was easy for me to do. Right. Well, I see some comments here. Uh, someone says, I've never once doubted I didn't get the job or the promotion yeah. based on my race. Gender, maybe, which is good. We, you know, intersectionality is a big thing. We have to think about other yeah. differences other than race. Uh, but those do play into, uh, uh, you know, some of the discrimination that's going on. Mm -hmm. Eric says... I'm white. I imagine I've benefited from having white bosses who hired mostly white employees. I imagine there would have been at least implicit bias that prevented me from getting the jobs I've gotten. True. True. Yeah. And so, and sometimes these things aren't, this is the, this is the thing about uh, white supremacy and racism. Sometimes you don't even have to try. It's kind of like a uh, Ron Papil said it and forget it. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it. It's the system has been again, baked into who we are as a country. So it just continues to perpetuate perpetuate itself unless you take effort which is what we're here about today exactly that's the point yeah. you, you we will call that's why it's called implicit bias you know yeah. and I, I know glenn and i've talked a little bit about we're not we're not fans of the term unconscious bias um because we think that kind of gives people too much of an excuse at least i think that's the way you said it glenn i know yeah, that's yeah. The way I feel about it because um, once we become aware of those biases uh biases then we need to start working to dismantle them it's not like exactly. we're just oh i didn't know i was biased yes you do you know you know your emotions, your feelings, and reactions to certain people and groups. So now deal with it. How will you overcome that bias? And that's the great thing about what's going on right now. The nation, really the world is having a bit of a reckoning with that, where it's harder and harder to deny awareness of those biases. And that's why I'm so glad everybody who's here today is here and listening, because we're taking the opportunity to learn more about it and, and resist those biases. And some more comments here, Scott. I grew up getting the benefit of the doubt. If I did something stupid, it's because I was doing something stupid, not because I was stupid. Mm. I was assumed to be a good kid doing bad things. That's, we see that in the news a lot these days. I never give a thought to how will someone perceive my race, being a man, yes, being white, no. Mm. But yeah. as a not white person, this is Q, thank you. I had to, to learn early on to code switch and be calm as to not scare white people and perpetuate the angry black man stereotype. That's a powerful one. And as a white guy with black children who are children who identify as black, they're interracial. Um, I got to tell you, that's the toughest thing that I've been learning lately. My oldest is now 12 years old, uh, who was the age Tamir Rice was, right? I think when he mm -hmm. was killed by police officers within a matter of seconds for having a toy gun. Um, I grew up playing with toy guns all the time, never thought twice about it. Yeah. I grew up running through the woods and neighbors' yards, never thought twice about it. Now I've got to have the conversation, the talk with my 12 year old son about, hey, don't go through neighbors' yards unless you know them very well. Right. Uh, don't, you know, keep, keep your hoodie off when you're in certain situations. Yep. And certainly don't play with toy guns that even have the slightest bit of looking realistic. Mm -hmm. um, there's many situations like that. And that's, that's heartbreaking to have to have that conversation with a 12 year old boy. Yep. And, and code switching was, was mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so code switching is basically, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like you're bilingual, you have to learn how to talk uh, uh, a proper way, a certain way in, in different environments, uh, rather than what you would maybe, how you would communicate with your friends, people that you're hanging out with. So you learn how to communicate uh, maybe in a different vernacular versus the professional uh, uh, expected way of, of communicating and, and conveying your, your information uh, in the business world or in, in white society. I was just going to ask, I suspect that's the case, Glenn and Q, that's especially true in, in business or workplaces, I imagine. Yeah. You know? And so then one of the microaggressions that comes out of that uh, with people of color is that, you know, this, he speaks so well, 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of this uh, demeaning thing. Like, oh, wow, it's amazing. This, uh, this, this black person has been uh, educated in the United States can speak as well as I can speak. I mean, that's kind of right. what's behind that. This, oh, he speaks so well. Like, it's, like it's shocking. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't say that to a white person. No, so no, no. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Exactly. exactly. No. Yeah. A uh, couple other comments. It was much easier to be accepted in Palm Beach social circles being white. Yeah, Palm Beach is pretty, pretty white. I didn't think about it until I had to verbalize it to a business partner who was insisting that there was equal opportunity. Well, well, it's good you were thinking about it. That's good, Scott. Thanks. Tim, I had a clear pathway to prosperity. Talk about generational wealth. That's yeah. a huge thing. Sorry, you want to take that one, Glenn? About the pathway to prosperity? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, that's an important one. And I actually had to examine that with my own life. Uh, you know, and I'm, again, I'm a, you know educated upper middle class African-American person. And I was talking to my kids about, you know, about this. And I, and, and, I, and I didn't realize that both of my grandparents growing up in Mississippi own substantial amounts of property, but they actually work for the white guidance. So it was some, it's white guidance in Mississippi uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, from slavery that owned a family, but for some reason in Mississippi or this part of Mississippi, they stayed connected. And the black guidance actually, uh, and my and my mother's family, uh, which is a different set, worked for the white guidance. So the white guidance were powerful, and we actually benefited from the power of the white guidance uh, wow. to be able to vote. Uh, my family could afford to vote back in the the twenties and the the teens uh, wow. in Mississippi. They could pay the poll tax. Other black people couldn't. So even as I think about my life, I'm accepting the privilege of property, of, of wealth, and connection to the white power system uh, that, that has allowed me to have a head start over some others in the black community. I wow. mean, it's just, it's just amazing. So this thing is never really clean, clean cut, but I can own my privilege as an African-American. And so as a white person, you should really be able to own it. But my, my privilege was only derived from the white institution. Uh, and I think it was probably a really unique situation. Well, not really unique, because I've talked to other black people that have had similar experiences and we're all pretty well off. Uh, and we've, we've been pointed in the right direction, but it just shows you how generational wealth or generational access to power makes a big difference. Nice, I gotta highlight two things, first of all. I think that's a great example. And I know from some of the people I've talked to in other places, there's still to this day, there are many towns and cities that have bridges between different areas where they intentionally don't have walk paths so that Mm -hmm. neighboring communities will say, aren't able to walk into the higher end community, you know, and it's just that affects your opportunity. It affects so many things. And then Derek shared that he'd never heard the term code switching before. So thank you, Q and Glenn for sharing and speaking to that, because this is exactly what this conversation is about today, is raising awareness and some of the terms and issues that, that we may not all get exposure to. So, yeah. Great. All right. Thank you all for sharing that. Yeah, time ticking. Good, good interaction on the chat there. Yeah, definitely. And so as we think about this, and this kind of goes to the code switching, many students go through uh, imposter syndrome as they try to assimilate into a professional culture. And so uh, as you think about the expectations and bias and prejudice that we have, I mean, just imagine if you are a, uh, my, my ch- <laughs> this is a weird thing, right? My daughter is black, right? She's, my wife is black, I'm black, my daughter's black, but everybody thinks she's biracial. It's just, mm-hmm. this is the weirdest thing. People question her all the time. And so, you know, for people of color, it's, you're trying to navigate these different worlds, you're, tr- you're trying to fit in, but then if you, do rise to a level of success, you feel like you don't belong. You don't know which community you're connected to uh, mm-hmm. because of the stereotypes and the implicit bias that society puts on you externally. Then you begin to internalize those things, this internalized oppression, which keeps people from a- achieving. So the same images that makes uh, uh, white people fearful of people of color or, hey, you know, the, the Mexicans, the immigrants are coming to, to, to steal your jobs, to, to rape your wives. You, you know, that same thing, those same images are ingested by those pe- people of color. 
well, am I, am, am I, do I, am I really a predator or my relatives really predators or do I really belong here? Will I ever be accepted? So these, those, these are things that we need to think about and how it impacts uh, other people in their lives. Yes. All right. Let's keep moving. Our time is ticking. Yeah. Um, we might not have a lot of time to discuss this, but I, I do think these questions are good. As you start thinking about your organization and your business, what are the origins of your organization of company? or company, who started it? You know, what, what was the clientele that you had in mind? All those things go into shaping your corporate culture. And so as we think about racism or systemic oppression being baked in, we need to start thinking about the foundations of our company, you know, who's, who's leading these organizations. Uh, and are there any barriers uh, that make it more, more difficult for a person of color to be served by your institution or to work in your institution? And so we had an earlier, a question about, hey, I want to hire, hire someone, a uh, uh, person of color. I think that's great, but but but, will that person be able to be successful once you hire them? That's the next step. Do I have an environment that will allow a person of color to feel like they belong, to actively contribute, or will they go back to that imposter syndrome? I don't really belong here. This isn't really my. Uh, this is really my, my ocean, you know, I got to come out and breathe every five minutes. Those are the things we start need to think about. So these are questions you really should wrestle with as you think about your business and how it relates to, to racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Definitely. I know we're running a little short on time, Glenn, but you mentioned the, um, the culture thing. And I just want to call that out because that was one of the biggest learnings I had out of the White Fragility book too, again, was the, the concept of using culture as an excuse during the hiring practice. And Call it implicit bias, call it what you want, because we don't realize we're doing it. But all, so many times I've heard the excuse when trying to hire somebody, well, I just don't think they're a cultural fit. Hmm. And what is really happening there in many cases, not always, but in many cases, is we're making an excuse for not hiring the person of color yeah. or not hiring somebody who's different than us for some reason. And, you know, frankly, that person, if, if, if they don't fit your culture, you need them. Because the reality is if you've got a very homogeneous culture, your company is not going to be as successful because at the end of the day, you don't have a diverse enough perspective right. on what you're building. So um, that was a big takeaway for me to stop. You know, anytime you hear that excuse of they, they're not a cultural fit. Yep. You got to second guess it and say, wait a minute, why are we saying that? Yep. I, I call that pedigree bias. Uh, that's, oh, that's my that's term, term that I use, but pedigree bias basically means that, Hey, well, did you go to school X, Y, Z, or did you grow up in X neighborhood? Uh, or did, do, you, are you, do you belong to this, you know, organization? Those are all the pedigree things that we say, oh, that, that, that person is great. But what we're really saying is, oh, we want someone just like us. Um, and with the disruption of, of COVID-19, you know, there's a lot of data that suggests companies that will practice uh, cultural competency, that had strong diversity, equity, inclusion programs, were actually more successful dur during this time because they're used to shifting work environments and paying attention to differences uh, and having a more varied creative approach to doing work. So they are actually doing better uh, uh, in this COVID environment than some other co uh, companies. Great, great point. Yeah, the data's there, the data's coming out for this. It's one of the benefits of COVID, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. great. All right. So let's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll skip this one. Uh, okay. The time. Great. Oh, this one didn't come in right. Uh, no, I think it will. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. So let's just set the stage as you start to think about doing this work in your organization. I think that's why we're all here. People ask, well, why should I, I work at this? Uh, what's important? Well, I, I think there are five different things that you can focus on in your organization as far as your why for doing this. If you have to communicate it with a board, if you have to communicate with the, uh, your various constituency. First of all, you can say, hey, we're, we just want to create awareness. Uh, we know we have a lot to learn. We want to be uh, relevant and current with what's going on. So we need to talk about race, racism, maybe other forms of discrimination in order just to be aware of what's going on in the market, what we have to respond to as a, as a, as a company, uh, what changes we may need to make. The next stage is knowledge. Okay, we are aware of what's going on. Well, how do we respond? Uh, uh, what do I need to learn more about? Uh, you know, which group am I targeting? What are my blind spots? What do we need to do as far as an evaluation? Like those questions that I asked earlier about, you know, 
our foundation, uh, our history, where we need to go. So we want to build a certain knowledge base, common terms that we can we can share with our organization or our employees. Uh, that, so that's the second phase. And the next one is skills. Okay, I want to develop some skills. How to how to communicate cross uh, cross culturally. Uh, how to create a, a, a successful environment so women, uh, people of color can can thrive. Uh, what are the tools and skills that I need to do? You know code switching, you know, how do, you know, how do I do that? Or what, what, what is it? What are the skills I need to do? I need to have to communicate with different groups. Then next is action steps. Okay, we want to do some internal things in our organization. We're going to change our bylaws. We're going to change our policies. We're going to look at different vendors. So our, our vendor vetting process, we're going to change our uh, HR uh, procedures. Those are actions that you can take once you move through this cycle. And the next thing is advocacy. Hey, we're, we're limited as far as the, the internal diversity, but we want to uh, do things to create uh, a more impactful brand. Ben and Jerry's did a great job with this uh, as they responded to Black Lives Matter and some of the other things that are going on in society. But you may want to, to donate, to be philanthropic, uh, to volunteer, to encourage volunteering uh, in your organization to do more outwardly focused work as it comes to uh, uh, racial equality, racial justice. So these are five things you can say, hey, these are five whys that I'm wrestling with. I want to do these, one of these things as I think about it for my organization. All right, let's go to the next one. And so uh, basically we have cultural awareness, which is, um, well, we'll start with cultural knowledge, it just means, you know, we, we're learning about these behaviors, cultural awareness, being open to change. We want to be open to change. Cultural sensitivity is understanding that differences uh, exist, and we want to start managing those differences, appreciating those differences. This is where creativity comes in when we start inviting other people in for their ideas. We put all these things together, we have our cultural competency. And so, that's the system that we use. All of our tools, practices, uh, policies, procedures are how we practice this cultural competency. Um, I don't have time to explain like the, the flow of cultural competency, but it goes from uh, denial to acceptance. Uh, hmm. You can't, if you're in denial where you say, hey, there's no, there's no race issues. If you're in denial, you really can't do it as work. Uh, if you're in acceptance, then you're maximizing it. You're creative, you're functioning well, you have a diverse team. But there are some different ways uh, to get from here to there. Uh, I have an assessment that I do for people to help see where you are on this continuum. Uh, most people are what we're, are in what we call minimization. That's kind of in the middle. Minim minimization is when we kind of say, uh, can't we all get along? Uh, let's look at how we are alike. Let's look at our similarities. So that's one phase. That's where a lot of organizations are. That's a good starting point. Let's go to the ne next slide. And then I want to make sure we have some time to get a few questions. But I normally uh, take people through this five phase intercultural journey. First is getting the commitment. You know, are we willing to uh, devote resources, time, are the leaders on board with this? Uh, we're committed to doing something differently in our organization. The next is, hey, yeah, we, we're willing, so let's engage our uh, employees, let's engage our clients, uh, let's put together a program that's exciting, you know, this change process, and let's execute a plan. You know, we've created a baseline of where we are, we have a plan where we clearly define what the win is. Uh, many organizations fail because they say, hey, we want to be anti-racist. Well, what does that mean? You no, know, you need to have some tangible data and a tangible plan that you can execute. Then the next step is just creating the culture because once you start bringing in uh, diversity, you want to have a culture where these things work and thrive. Uh, being anti-racist uh, or, or combating racism uh, is not set it and forget it. You actually have to create a culture. You have to maintain it. You have to create different groups uh, uh, to be successful. Uh, different groups need different things. Men need different things than, than women. Uh, and so you have to create a culture that is sustainable. And then uh, managing your talent, bringing in people, uh, uh, looking at your vendors, who you do business with, all those are part of talent man management. And then finally, you move into the evaluation stage. How do we do? Uh, and then you, you say, let's, let's continue this work. Let's get better. Let's improve. Let's add goals. So that's the, that's the journey that you would need to go through. Uh, 
as, as business owners. Uh, that's, that's the work that I do with organizations to help them think through each of those phases. Once they figure out the why, then let's say, how do we get through these five different phases in our organization? So I think we might have a duplicate slide in there. So where are you on, on this journey? That's just a question. So where are you? Uh, that's something to think about in your organization. Where are you? Uh, but the first phase is just being committed. Uh, a lot of organizations, uh, some organizations, uh, they want to bring me in and say, hey, can you just come do a 30-minute training? That's not going to get it done. That's not commitment. <laughs> I, will, I will take that check. I'll take that check all day. Uh, but, but that's not really the heart of the work that I, that I do. <laughs> <laughs> Rather see the change actually applied than just talked about. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. All right. I think we had a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah. So questions we all have now, where do I begin? What should our company say or do? Uh, you know, maybe companies have figured it out. I think some companies are still struggling about what to say now, how to respond to the complexity of Black Lives Matter or, you know, the protests and those things. Uh, you know, are the statements that you're making harmful or helpful? Uh, and what can your company do to make a difference? And if you have no racial diversity, who can you talk to? Well, you can talk to to me or other professionals. Uh, there are many people out here out there doing this work. But I, what I will say is, just because a person is a person of color doesn't mean that they can do this work effectively. Just because a person is white doesn't mean they can't do the the work effectively. There are many trained professionals out there that are doing this work and can help you through this this time. Glenn and I both belong to a professional association in which we saw recently somebody was suddenly approached because they were basically because they were a person of color who does speaking to come in and do a session on diversity, equity, and inclusion. So make sure that whoever you reach out to has been doing it for a while, like Glenn has. You know, if, if, if it's not Glenn, make sure you reach out, make sure you know their history. I'm not the one to do it either by any means. I'm thrilled to have Glenn here, and that's why we brought him in. But great. And so with that, I think we come to the wrap up right on time. So um, again, if you guys do need anything on a servant leadership approach, great, come reach to me. But this is really about Glenn and diversity, equity, inclusion. I'm very grateful to Glenn for being able to do this presentation today. He put a lot of effort into our program that we were hoping to extend out into a four part series. Thank you. I know some of you here did want that. Um, we didn't end up following through with it because it just wasn't quite enough participation, but then we got a whole lot of interest in the free session. So thank you <laughs> yeah. who are here for the free version. Uh, do appreciate it very much. Glenn, you want to talk a little bit more about your business again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so I have some free resources on my website. I have a diversity goals checklist that, that will, you, you just go download that. Uh, it'll, 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 give you some ideas of how to start, how to begin. It doesn't cost you anything other than your email address. Um, and also I have a, a couple of, uh, uh, click on my training tab. It kind of shows you some of the training programs that I do offer. Uh, I offer a kind of a jump start to get you started, to teach you the basics. Uh, so a little bit more intense than what we've, what we've done here. Uh, and also, you know, evaluation, uh, actually uh, evaluation assessment that you can take to say, hey, where am I as far as my level of cult cultural competency? Uh, and so, yeah, just willing to work with you in any way, feel free to reach out, uh, no, no pressure, but, but do download that diversity. I use, my, I use my own checklist, I like it. It's a good checklist to get you thinking about uh, what, what goals you want to begin setting as far as uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's great. And that's at glengeiton.com, right? Yep, yeah, glengeiton.com. I'll make it easy. Make it easy for you. Right. <laughs> and it's one N in Glen. I made a mistake. Just one N. We couldn't afford that second one. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> I do see a couple of uh, comments that people appreciated this, Glenn. This is great. Um, so if you guys are interested, definitely reach out to Glenn. He's got a lot of great material. I've seen it. It's some fantastic stuff. So thank you all for joining today. Yeah, thank uh, you so much. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Great comments today in the chat. Do appreciate all your contributions, gang. It was a good discussion. So yeah, y'all were great. Y'all were a great chat. Y'all were one of the best chat audiences that I've ever had. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd agree. They were definitely outspoken. So thank you. Yeah. All righty. Well, thank, thank you all you. very much. Take care. Have a wonderful afternoon. Oh, and I do. I did want to make one statement. That is very simply that, uh, especially to the white members of this audience, you know, guys. Now there is just this great momentum going on right now, and I'm counting on you and talking to you guys, what we need to do is use that white privilege that we have to please, 
please put it in service of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and helping those of people of color who are, who could use our service. They don't need it. We're not some white saviors. They don't, they're just looking for equality. So please put that white privilege into service. Thank you, gang. Thank you I think all. That was it. Have a good afternoon. Good evening. All right. Sounds good. Talk Bye. to you later.